I'm Roger Walsh, and our co-host is John Dupuy. And with us today is a guest who I'm truly delighted and honored to have with us to discuss his work. That is Hamid Ali. And uh, perhaps a, one way of giving a background to Hamid's amazing work is to just take a step back and take a look at the context of our times, particularly the spiritual times. I'm based in San Francisco, where all the world's spiritual traditions are available. And we tend to forget how rare this is in human history, to forget the fact that throughout most of history, anyone who examined or practiced uh, anything other than the state-sanctioned tradition was in grave, grave danger of ending up on a funeral pyre. And looking back, I can't think of a time since Alexandria 2,000 years ago when there was another time when so many of the world's traditions were available. There are a small number of people who are attempting to look across these traditions and find commonalities as well as their uniquenesses. And there are still a smaller number who are integrating these and systematically uh, integrating with uh, contemporary psychological research. The, the notable people include, of course, Ken Wilber and our guest today, Hamid Ali. And Hamid is has not only done extraordinary intellectual synthetic work, but is the creator of a, a school, a spiritual school, a, a complete path. And it's very rare to found a complete path, particularly one which is set up to perpetuate over time to train teachers systematically. And yet this is what Hamid has done. The Ridwan school and the so-called diamond work, as he calls it, flow out of his own direct experience and realization, but they're informed by the world's spiritual traditions and practices. And so Hamid is very rare in creating a, a spiritual path, a school, a body of literature, which of enormous synthetic scope, I'm going to try to pick up just the part of his literature that I have. <laughs> and, uh, and we're not going to try to cover all these today. But uh, I would like to focus on two of his most recent books, which are my favorites. They're Runaway Realization and the Alchemy of Freedom. And they're my favorites, partly because they're so rare in what they teach and, and speak about, partly also because Hamid has spent decades laying out an extraordinary synthesis and a progressive path of realization in his school. And in these books, he steps off his own map, as he to use his own words. He goes beyond his own prior teachings, public teachings, and even, as I understand it, the school teachings, to step back to a larger context, which he calls the fourth turning, or the view of totality. So that's a way of trying to do, <laughs> give an overview or a context for this remarkable man and the, the body of uh, work and literature and teaching and inspiration he's given. On a more personal note, Amid has, uh, well, I haven't been a member of his school. I have been deeply touched and inspired by your work, Amid, and the, the gifts you've given in so many ways and the depths uh, you've opened for so many of us. So for me, this personally is a very meaningful opportunity to dialogue with you in this way. And thank you so much for being with us. Um, as I look across your work, it seems that the cutting edge, your cutting edge and your cutting practice is one of inquiry, direct inquiry into experience and thereby into the fundamental nature of reality and realization. Is that a fair characterization? And could you expand on that? I think you're right, uh, Roger. Good to be here first. And to talk with you and um, the approach I use, the kind of contemplation and meditation I call inquiry, because it is a kind of 
a questioning or a questioning uh, curious attitude about what is happening to understand it and penetrate its whatever underlies it, whatever implied by it as deeply, as completely as possible. And what we find in this path is that the inquiry is basically opens up uh, the experience to its potential, to what's implied in it, because all of our experiences, all of our being is interconnected. There's nothing separate from another. So it's not like we need to get rid of one thing to get to the another thing. No, the thing, the surface is connected to the depth. You know, it's meaningful to the depth. By understanding it, connect us to what something deeper or other than it. So it is a far-ranging inquiry because I just inquire what's happening in experience and perception and uh, other people and question and my studies, all, all of them are connected, which bring up sort of thing I'm interested to explore. And exploration also I know, is really guided by a force that coming from the deepest recesses of being that is itself is really guiding the inquiry, the questioning and the, and the direction of what, what questions come up what experiences arise as a response to the questions. Because the, the answers to the questions are experiences, they're not words, usually. But I find the met this method satisfying, fun, and you could do it all the time. You don't have to have a particular uh, formal you know, practice session to do it. Although I've formulated many ways for a student to do them in a, some kind of formal practice session. But as, basically the practice is ongoing. Oh. And so, as I see it, you, you inquire into your experience and you teach students and all of us, those who read your books, to inquire very deeply into experience. And there's a premise underlying that it seems that um, that reality, that living being, as you call it, is inherently we can trust that a, that at a fundamental level we tr can trust real living being to unveil itself, reveal itself, open us to ever greater possibilities and depths. Does yeah, that... that's uh, very uh, correct in terms of uh, it's implied. What I call basic trust, I mean inherent trusting in reality that we're actually born with. It might get uh, sort of narrowed because of experience, but there's basic trust in reality and consciousness that not only it is good, it will be fine for us, but it will take us to what is good for us, what we need to learn. Reality is uh, uh, self-revealing, and one, in some sense, it just inherently reveals itself whenever the opportunity is present. Yeah, and I think back to my earliest uh, explorations of experience, which occurred in psychotherapy, and I was very fortunate to be with a gifted therapist. And what I, I think perhaps one of the greatest gifts I came out of that with was the, the recognition that the mind is not something and our experience is not something to be avoided, to be that we have to approach with fear or distrust as most people do. But rather that give, if we bring awareness to the mind and our experience, the mind is self-healing, self-actualizing, self-directing, self-transcending. But as I have read your work, I've come to appreciate that, uh, no, that needs to be expanded, that one of the points you make, and particularly in these two books, uh, Runaway Realization and the Alchemy of uh, Freedom, is that um, 
motivation matures through various levels and that we start with the sense that we are doing it and then more and more it becomes a recognition uh, you know there's the old conundrum, conundrum is it good works or grace well are they even different and you speak very eloquently to that yeah and that's what i call the paradox of practice and all you know people who practice all the paths of practice you know the the masters know that the practice by itself doesn't do it. That uh, frequently the practice brings you to the point of seeing you can't do it. You know, I remember one of my meditation teachers when we asked, what is the purpose of meditation? He said, hopelessness. <laughs> yeah. When you realize you're helpless and hopeless, then, then something, something happens. Because the method is not exactly what the, the method is, way of approaching it until it exhausts itself. And then you stop. You, you really come to a place where you don't try to go anywhere. You give up without it being a despondency. You give up by recognizing our objective helplessness, the helplessness of the individual mind to actually penetrate reality. And, and there seems to be the, um, what we'd say in the Christian tradition is grace um, functioning there as we get to the hopelessness of our own condition yeah. and our own minds, something happens that it's way beyond ourselves. And I, I've been reading uh, the philosopher's Stones. I just finished it and yeah. I can only read about four or five pages because each page is another illumination. And I have to sit back and absorb that. Uh, one of the first things that grabbed me when you talked about the initial activation of a spiritual experience. And that happened to me when I was 11. And that just changed the whole course of my life. Either in your words, I was in hot pursuit of God or God was in hot pursuit of me. Uh, and there's a subtle difference there, but it just... It just changed everything. I was never the same. I could never get that experience of God is everywhere. God is love and God is real. Oh, my God, why didn't they tell me this in church? You know, <laughs> and um, I, it made me wonder, once you talk about people say, when was your enlightenment experience? And you go, which one? What was your initial activation experience? And what was that like? My initial activating experience is recognizing presence of uh, awareness, the, the authentic presence of being that is what recognize what I am, and recognizing it at the same time that is the true essence of all human beings, that connects all human beings. And I remember that, you know, late 60s, something like that happened. It wasn't in a meditation or anything, it just happened in life. And for a few days, I mean, it isn't, it isn't what most people talk about. It wasn't transcendent. It was a very embodied, like this is what is real about me and about human being when we really know ourselves. It is a living present, we could call it spiritual, but it is like, a, this is what I call in one of my books. You recognize it as other, meaning it's really different from anything I've known about myself and reality. And how old were you, Hamid, at that point? What's that? How old were you chronologically when you had this, this first activation? Uh, I might have been late 20s, early 30s. Yeah, yeah. yeah it wasn't early. I, I wasn't consciously spiritual till in my 20s. I was a scientist before that. Well, it still, <laughs> it still shows. And I had a, another question. I This book has just been, anyway, it's been an incredible spiritual journey for me to get through it. And it brought so many things together and your ideas that uh to me it, it's not, you know we're both roger and i are very very steeped in the teachings of, of ken wilbur and i yeah. think what how it came to me is that 
this was that step beyond second tier, beyond um, um, late second tier. I, I've stopped calling it colors because they keep changing to get into that third tier. And what you're teaching seems to transcend uh, the dual and the non-dual, transcends both of them and brings them together in a whole new a whole new package that is incredibly powerful. And it's almost like the jump we say an in, in integral from the first tier to second tier. Well, the leap to this third tier or this, this stuff that's coming through you in this book, it's just that shockingly uh, brilliant and, and game changing to, to, to experience this. And I like the way that you, you know, said hierarchies is often necessary. It's part of it. But at this particular thing, it all becomes everything is a hologram. God is in everything, everywhere. And all of this, and we're going to speak about the mystery, but that, that, that certainly uh, impacted me and did not negate the work I've been doing for years, but just brought it together in, in an extraordinary manner. And I, 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 Sri Aurobindo once said, I read, that his practice was writing. So I wondered what it's like for Hamid. Did you have all these got ideas together or did they start falling or coming into place or something was, some higher source was coming through you in the experience no, no, of writing? I, I don't have them together. Uh, they just come through like... Uh, one insight and perception comes every few days, and at some point, uh, something that's been thread been going on for weeks or days or something comes together in some kind of experience I didn't expect. You know, and the nice thing about what I call third fourth turning, you know, you, you call it second tier, is that uh, the kind of opening, the awakening are completely unexpected. Unexpected, unanticipated, and thought. Because many of them, I never read about them, I never thought about them, I never looked for them. You see, I didn't know they existed. <laughs> it comes, it happens, and it makes me say, wow, what happened? <laughs> Reality can't be this way. So for a while, it makes me, I have to explore, find, is this really real? I mean, it's, you know, so it takes a while to authenticate. But the thing about what I found out as a result, you know, very important thing you probably saw in those two books, is that each, each realization, each awakening has a view. And the view, perspective about reality that expresses the particular experience. Each experience, basically, like if you're a non-dual realization, that makes you see that uh, you develop the view that uh, the universe is one unit, expanded, infinite, and everything is interconnected, and it's all made out of consciousness or awareness. Or, and and that is an experience, but also becomes a mental view. And each teaching talk of you, like Zokchen, for to talk about the view of Zokchen, it's very important. You have to get the view, and then you get the transmission. And it's natural that there will be a view for any realization. So what happens, I notice, is that when we are in a particular realization, we develop that view, that view it might displace our previous view, like the egoic view, but it becomes the new one. But it is a view, and reality doesn't have views. Only a human being can have a view, you see? So the view is the human mind developing it, depending the way reality manifesting itself. So what I found out is, it's good to have a view, to get the view, but not to take the view to be reality. <laughs> but it is just the view from one way reality manifests itself. Or at least not ultimate reality. In some sense, it is reality, but it is not the CH, you know, capital R reality. Well, I mean, you could call it ultimate. Some teaching take their views as ultimate. You know, Veda Vedanta take the non dual ultimate, mm -hmm. and take their thing as ultimate. They, they think that's mm -hmm. ultimate, that's mm -hmm. it, you got it. And I'm finding out 
partly because I explored many of those, the, the ultimates were not the same. So the idea is that each realization, any awakened condition, is uh, it's an experiential, immediate, non-conceptual, but it has its view that informed the mind about what reality is. And the mind tend to take that view to be, that's how reality is. Holding on to a view becomes a delusion, regardless of the realization. A delusion in the sense it prevents other ways reality can manifest. So, Hamid, what is the, the healthy attitude when you have one of these huge uh, illumination, illuminatory uh, experiences that just overwhelming? How do you hold that without reifying that and making that the one thing? Well, I mean, you definitely you explore it, you learn about it. It's okay to develop the view, but at some point, you need to, you, you, after you know understanding it as fully as possible. We need to remember that there might be other things about reality. That the, the deep understanding is that reality is endless in its possibilities, and whatever realization we have, we should not take it to be the final one. And, and this is a very distinctive. Uh, perspective of your teaching in a way, because so many traditions take a particular experience or insight or state or realization to be definitive, to be the way, the final realization, the view, the perspective, the understanding of reality. And, and what I, so many of us, I think, love about your, your own take is the recognition that uh, that real that reality living being is endlessly creative and can unveil a boundless number of perspectives and possibilities and and you describe that as the as the view of totality a view or view a kind of meta perspective which is open to a boundless number of perspectives yes yeah. so the view of totality is openness to all views meaning I can take on a view, but I don't have to. So there is a freedom there. I take on a view to learn about it, but I don't have to identify with it. I don't have to, you know, there could be certainty in it that this is real, this is fundamental. But that doesn't mean it is really the end of all. I mean, I... Several times I caught, I was caught into this uh, in this dilemma, believing, well, this is it, I got it, you know, and I was wasn't just mental, I was experientially certain this is reality. And then now it's true, it is reality, but that doesn't mean <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one. <laughs> yeah, reality is much more mysterious and much more rich than that turns out to know. Yes, and I love that, um, that your view of totality and you allow for endless realizations, endless openings, uh, an appreciation of the boundless creativity of reality of life, of, of, of the Tao, God, however you whatever term we want to use to point to that. And, 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 it's a, and I want to acknowledge, as far as I understand, it's a very rare perspective. The only other uh, treatment that I know of this or really investigation of this kind of grand, this meta-meta perspective is uh, in Hawaiian Buddhism in the, what's what they call the round view, which uh, is seems very similar in acknowledging the boundlessness of possibilities and perspectives. Does that, does that resonate? Uh, how do you see the... the About which kind of Buddhism did you mention? Hawaiian. Hawaiian. No, Hawaiian Buddhism has a particular view of realization, which is non-dual. It's not the non-dual view. It's a, another view of uh, what I call unilocal, or they call interpenetration, 
which is instead of everything is unified by having the same fabric as uh, non-duality says, and they say everything is unified because everything is in, in everything else. And that one particular thing contains all other particular things at all times and space. So the unity is different. And they have that view, that one particular view, mm -hmm. you see? And so it is another view, all which right. For me, and, and the, the, the interesting thing, you know, Roger, is that many teaching, they're really working toward liberation. They want to be free and liberated. And their view gives them that, their liberation. It is liberation, it is freedom from suffering, all of that. But that, and although this is part of my, uh, you know, my drive, you know, since I was young, but also my drive also is an understanding reality. I want to know what is reality. That's why I went into the sciences. I want to know what is the truth of things, you know. And um, so I'm still, you know, that's what it is. I want to know the truth as whatever the truth happened to be, you know. And turn down the truth is multifaceted, multi, you know, dimensional, has unexpected turns to twist. Reality really has much more up its sleeve than any human being <laughs> can imagine. And I think the realization that are possible, I think humanity as a whole, we've discovered some of them. We didn't discover all of, you know, there's a lot to come. I don't know all of them. I am still learning. You know? <laughs> and and this um, this view of totality uh, gives you a, a very different understanding of of realization that there's no there's no finality. That and uh, I, let me try and give my understanding of what you're saying, and then you can elaborate and correct that that most traditions suggest that, that liberation, freedom uh, from suffering and many other things is to be found in a particular insight and understanding and, and, and experience. And you're, you're, you're saying that that's true, partly true, and there's a deeper freedom in not needing any particular realization in being open to the fluidity and endlessness of and variety of realities. Could you uh, correct well, or I mean, elaborate? You know, I, the, the beautiful thing about the view of totality is that there's no comparison. You know. there, I can see hierarchy, but I, everything can be looked at a way. You know, and... Uh, So, uh, so there's really uh, so each view or each realization has liberation. It is, is liberating, and it is sufficient for uh, for somebody who wants a path for, for liberation. But that also. However, the view of totality make us be more tolerant of other views, open to them. So all views have are real, you know, the genuine teaching, and they bring liberation. And uh, not only that, but they uh, they they add, they, add, they add, let's say, to our. Uh, you also uh, say that there's no end point, like I'm enlightened, being that's it. Enlightenment itself evolves. So I think that's incredibly exciting and also very humbling for a lot of people. If you think you, you know, you got it. Well, you did, but you yeah. got that step. You know, it keeps moving, it keeps going. It's, that is very liberating in itself. It's awesome. You're right. There, there's uh, just. <laughs> I mean, it's liberating in a, in a different way. 
One of the gifts these two books, The Alchemy of Freedom and Runaway of Realization, have given me was your emphasis on the possibility of opening to an end to boundless realizations that th there was no need not be any finality to these and that there was perhaps an even greater freedom in opening to a, um, a fluidity of perspectives and stances and views. And for me, being such an achievement-oriented type, and even to the point of having burnt out very badly at one stage in my practice, this was so helpful and just felt like a big exhale, a release of, oh, yes. So... <laughs> Um, I personally am deeply grateful for this this perspective. It's just been very meaningful and valuable for me. Well, I'm happy to see that you appreciate it because it really, it's more like you end up in a place where you, there's no concern about where we are, what happens to be in the experience. Simply the concern is gone. You know, like, I, am I in this condition, that condition, realized, not realized? It's all insignificant question. It's irrelevant. Or divine indifference, I think, in the book. Yeah. Is that what it's about? Yeah. Yeah, like, well, wherever we are, it's just reality doing its thing. Even in the dualistic perspective, it's reality. Who else is doing it? <laughs> <See>? I give up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like God is love. How bad can it get? You know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, the non-dual views take an error is not seeing the truth of non-duality. And it's true, the dual view doesn't see the view, the, the place of non-duality. But that doesn't mean it's an error. It is, that's how reality happened to be manifesting itself at that time. And if we take that to be the only view, that's the error. Mm -hmm. It's not right. that the way it is is an error. It's, it's holding on to one thing as is turned out to be a really a big error that many people do. And any, it can be in any realization and take that. I, I call it delusion. I remember, um, uh, what's his name? You know, uh, Dogen, mm -hmm. to, saying to, about one of his uh, talks about delusion after enlightenment. Wow. Yes. And that, that's been a very helpful thing and, and quite rare again. I mean, in these two books, you point out that there's this assumption that awakening leads to the end of delusion, and that, that delusion seems to be endless. It gets more subtle but there may not be an end to it. Yeah, the delusion can be simply the belief that this is it. There's no <laughs> other thing, because that's not true. If it's not true, it's a delusion. I got it. You see, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Hamid, one thing that was useful for me, because, you know, you use the term true nature a lot, which I've, obviously I've heard, but it's never, you know, been that much yeah. part of my path. So sometimes when I was working with a particular passage, I was stuck to, to God instead of true nature. And it's like, hmm, it turned out to be, you know, one of the best, I don't know, teachings or explanation of the nature of God, whatever that is, that uh, it really worked for me. And, and it doesn't work all the time, 100% of the time, but often that just, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad it works for you. I mean, yeah. you can call whatever you want. Some people call God or divine being. The Buddhists talk about Buddha nature. You know, I mean, everybody got their thing. It is like, what is the, what's the mystery of this, of, of the whole thing? What is the mystery? What? What is behind this? What makes it happen? What makes it be the way it is? You know. And also the thing in in reality that brings about both liberation and fulfillment, meaning we're free from difficulties, 
but we're also fulfilled in the sense a large part of our potential is being actualized and we're living it in our life. And our life is fulfilled. Yeah. Mm. And you pointed just a couple of minutes ago to the idea that any experience is still uh, still reality displaying itself. And from the view of totality, the view of totality kind of undermines a, a traditional hierarchies of you know, certain experiences better than others, uh, seems to open the possibility to, of the recognition of all experience, the most mundane, being as spiritual as what we usually call the most profound. Yeah. Because there are realizations, for instance, where the perception of things is neither material nor spiritual. Like the, that dichotomy between physical and spiritual fall, falls apart. It it's, it's, turns out it's conceptual. You know, that reality is, is, you cannot say it's spiritual or, or material. However, that is another way you can say divide it into there is the spiritual and there is the physical, and that too is, is also workable. But there are others where it isn't. Sometimes I look at reality and say, well, these walls are they really consciousness or are they really physical? The question, is, the answer is, it's neither. It is something mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no final realization, no final answer. <laughs> uh, well, that's the thing. You see, for you, you find it as liberating. For some people, find it unsettling because they want a place to perch. Yes. They settle in it. That's it. I don't have to think anymore. You know, that's very, for people, it's sort of relieving. But, you know, my way is doesn't give people that kind of uh, comfort. You know, you have to be comfortable in, uh, in not having a place to settle. And uh, I call it, you know, what do I call it? I call it like a universal nomad. You know, you know travel is part of the journey, part of what's happening. Well, there, there's discovery there's discovery problem. is part of life discovery is part of realization like what happens when people talk about getting enlightened and they have the experience then what happens after that do they just sit <laughs> feeling enlightened and that's it <laughs> yeah and uh, and perhaps it's worth just playing with the, the very word enlightenment since you brought it up because as far as i can see this is one of the most it's it's really um, a p rather poorly defined term. It often conflates can be used for a particular experience or a, or a, for a state or a trait. It can be used for just one particular line of experience, such as a cognitive insight, as opposed to the deeper transformation of personality. Um, and it varies across traditions. I, I think I come to think that uh, as we usually use the term, it's a bit too loose and maybe spiritual maturity is a better better term. Yeah, I, I, that's one reason why I tend not to use the word enlightenment that much. I use words like awakening and realization, things like that, because I can define those more easily. I think someplace, I mean, you said that there was realization, but enlightenment is when you actually start going out into the world and being of service. That, that um, in a sense, uh, completes the circuit. It makes realization enlightenment. I think I got that idea from you. I hope I did. Um, it's one well, of I actually don't call that enlightenment, but I think, I think that's the completion of realization. Realization is not complete if you can't live it. If it's just an experience. I mean, it's, it hasn't completed itself. So that's just true about all paths. That first you have the realized state or condition, 
Next is to learn how to live it, how, how to be it in your life. And that is another stage, which is actually for most paths, as far as I know, is the one that takes longer time. You know, I remember, you know, story about one of the Zen, ma great Zen master, might have been Dogen, I don't know. When they, somebody asked him toward the end of his life, well, master, how is your realization going? And he said, well, going pretty well, but my body is still, you know, getting used to it. Mm. Yeah. And how do you interpret that? Well, it, it's not easy to be fully actualized, to live the realized condition, I meaning your body and mind, and your heart, all of it is expressing it as part of it. And mm -hmm. you are that and also you are expressing the realized condition in all situations of life. You see. Yeah. I mean, dealing with everyday, I mean, everyday life. I don't mean just sitting and, med and teaching or meditating. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about, about death when we die? I mean, what, what goes on in that process? That's a whole other topic. It's not in those books. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> no, it's not. It's not. But it's like, I feel I have the oracles of God like open to me. So I just want to ask some really important stuff that uh, I would love to hear your hit on that. <laughs> Well, obviously, so first of all, we have to understand from the beginning that each human being is not just a body, but a consciousness, a living consciousness. By a living consciousness, I don't mean just universal consciousness. I mean an individual consciousness, a particular individual consciousness that make you the particular unique you. And that consciousness is an expression of the larger consciousness or the fundamental true nature or divine nature, whatever you call it. It is a particularization of it in each one of us. And it is uh, undying, just like the fundamental true nature is undying. It's because it's beyond time. It doesn't have beginning and end in terms of time. So that consciousness will survive, bound to survive. It doesn't make sense for it not to survive. Mm -hmm. And um, that says death is not the end for our experience. We can begin, we can continue having experience and understanding and practice all of that. I think many traditions adhere to that point of view. So I have, my view is not that radical. And, um, but what I will say is that how we live our life, how, how much we have learned will um, influence how we are as we die and after we die. And also, if we haven't learned how to learn, it will be difficult to learn afterward, we'll be lost, you know. And, and that could determine what happens. Yeah. I, I almost died about four years ago. I had a massive heart attack uh, yeah. coming out of a gym. Yeah. And the first thing I thought about was my dog who was in a hotel room. So I'm having this massive heart attack. I'm driving behind this old guy in a pickup truck, 3.8 miles to get there. <laughs> and anyway, so my, my first, I, I should have flipped it over and God should have been the first thing. But when I finally got to the... Uh, and collapsed on the bed with my dog. Yeah. I said, okay, I can die now. She's, she's taken <laughs> care of. And uh, yeah, but God was, you know, was foremost. And I really wasn't that scared. You know, it's like, hey, if this is it, my dog's going to be okay. And, and uh, you know, it hasn't been a completely wasted life. I've tried to, to help and do good. And it's been quite an adventure. So uh, that was really remarkable that there wasn't, there wasn't that fear. And they took me in. To the emergency room there just happened to be a, a center in, in colorado where i was that took care of these kind of things and they put a stent you know in my heart and all of a sudden oh it all came back I said oh gosh i'm gonna i'm gonna live well that's that's okay too and uh, then i said thank you doctor you just saved my life 
So yeah, that that that's like my dog and God. Of course, you turn a dog on its stomach. Yeah, so did you have a near death experience in the sense you experience yourself, not the body? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Uh, I was still I was still conscious. But yeah. after I went to the the uh, ICU, they put me after the stent. I had like five hours of incredible clarity, yeah. emotionally, psychologically, relationally. Uh -huh. I see. Yeah, I thought. I'm probably going to die because doesn't this happen sometime right before you die? But then after five hours, it was like I got kicked in the chest by a mule. And, oh, you know, I went back into my my uh, my sick heart attack body. But I had I actually called some people and cleaned up some messes, you know, that uh, I hadn't taken care of interrelationally. And uh, anyway, it, it's it was, great that you didn't have fear because many people have fear and resistance and stuff and fear of loss and stuff like that. And you didn't have fear. That's good. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and I still fear death as a human being walking around. I don't want to yeah. get hit by a truck. But in the moment when it felt yeah. like I was going to die, um, there wasn't fear. It's a different state of consciousness, yeah. Just say, hey, God, if this is it, welcome, you know. Uh, welcome me it's, back. And yeah, here. I usually see, you know, dying is just going to the next thing, you know. And another way of experiencing things. You know, here we are in the physical body, basically to discover and learn uh, about ourselves in a certain way. The physical body gives us an opportunity for certain kind of experiences. Without it, we won't have that opportunity, but we have other kind of opportunities. You know, sometimes I've I've experienced where I'm. It's like the oracles are open to me. I mean, it's all there. I just have to ask the right question. And one time I was in um, an, a situation like that, and I was like, "Okay, help me not to screw this up." And just as I asked <clears throat> you about death, I asked God about death, and I said, yeah. "Well, God, what about death?" And the answer very, very clearly said, "I will be there." And I was like. Okay, I don't need to know anymore. That that's enough for me. So <laughs> I I found that very beautiful and very comforting. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, actually, you know, it depends on one's view. You know, if you have a view, like I've known some people who who have the view that they believe in Jesus, for instance, and Jesus will save them, and I saw, like, after this person died, they actually saw Jesus afterward. Because I, I can see sometimes, see what, what's happening. And I was looking, and the person really met Jesus. You know, I, mean, I wouldn't have called it Jesus, but for her, it was Jesus. You see? And so she was very happy. <laughs> According to her view of reality, it's true. There is Jesus, and and it is a real. It's a real view. It's not like a made-up thing. You know, it's, that's how it happened to her. And that other people might experience other things. You know. Um, I, I had another question, and I don't know how many students you have, but I've lived with your students. I've been, you know. Second person, very connected to the diamond approach for many years. And do, is there a prerequisite when you become a student that you've had that initial activation? Or maybe if people hadn't, they wouldn't be interested in the school. How does that work? Well, no, that we don't require initial activation. because that's not an easy one. You know, some people have it, some people don't have it. And uh, some people get it while they are in the school. But an initial activation means encountering, uh, as I call this, uh, in a uh, close encounter of the, of the third kind, you know, with the true nature or the spiritual nature in a very clear way. Some people come in with a longing and, uh, or a need, uh, want to be free from suffering or longing for God or wanting to be liberated without necessarily yet having encountered what God is. You see, some people have, 
many people have had various experiences that brings them to the work. And they want to sort of continue. Well, I had this experience. So how do I go about it so I could have more, <laughs> get <laughs> deeper into it? You see. And one of the um, turning points that these two books speak to, Hamid, is the shift from uh, from an ex experience, one or two or more experiences or realizations of one kind or another, and what you call a runaway realization, that is a, an ongoing process of inquiry realization in which instead of a, a particular realization being regarded as final or a stopping point, it more becomes a portal for further possible openings. And you talk about the kind of dynamism which you speak of as act of, an activation that can occur, where the, the spiritual quest, the realization takes on a life of its own. And this kind of runaway realization opens. You say it's rare, but and you're not sure of everything that that leads to this, but please speak to this because it seems like a very important turning point. Yeah, it's something that many people don't understand or don't um, imagine. They think, because most paths don't talk like that. Most paths say, you want to get to this state. You want to get to shunyata. You want to get to divine. You know? And so that's what they work on. Runaway realization says, is that there is no end to what you can realize, what you can learn about reality or yourself. And runaway means uh, the process uh, has no control on it. Uh, your mind can't control it at all. Uh, it runs its course, you know, and um, it, it is liberated from view, from adhering to views. See, if you can emerge, you can go away. And so one realization can follow, and some of them can stay a few days, some of them can stay a few years, you know, so there's no control about it. You know, so it's a, it, for me, it is a continual process of discovery. It's exhilarating, actually. It's a, quite an adventure. And uh, some of them are, you know, some of the realization, as you know, are full of lights and radiance and brilliance and grace. Some of them are simple and ordinary and so, you know, all kind of things. You know, they're, they're all real and, <laughs> and you know, I, 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 for me, my life is, 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 uh, is being process of that. And continues. I, I haven't gotten to a place where I feel I want to sit there. I've done that before, but I learned that things don't work that way for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not in control. I, suppose I, as an individual, you know, as the individual is not in control of what happens. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, what, what have you found that allows a person to make that kind of shift to from a, a more static, shall we call it, approach to spiritual, spirituality and realization to this more dynamic, endlessly opening, runaway realization? One of them is really a true curiosity. <laughs> like curiosity means... You really want to know, you're questioning, you're, you're not interested in finding a final answer. You just want to know what, what, what is the truth of things. And uh, if it is really true, coming from the true heart, you know, it's, uh, it becomes a second nature or first nature, where it just happens on its own. And it's uh, it's more like uh, like you know recently, for instance, you know last year or so, I've been thinking about time. 
you know, it's about time and timelessness and nowness and all of that. And most spiritual teaching basically say time is a delusion. It's a delusion. It's not real. The real thing is the spirit is outside of time. It's timeless. But I remember reading uh, some of the Zen teachings some few years ago, and they say, a blade of grass is time. And I said, well, what does that mean, blade of grass is time? What is the time they talk about? And when I read the commentaries, everybody, most people say, well, they, they mean it's moment of time. I said, well, but they say at some places it's moment of time, but here they say it's time. So I didn't have an answer for it. But that's the question stayed in my mind until some time ago, I recognized, oh, there is really a, me a reason why they say it's time, because we can experience things as time, mm -hmm. as pure time. Most people don't anticipate anything like that. For most people, time is something that passes, invisible, just we know it through, you know, changes. We could look at the clock, you feel a passage of something, you don't know what it is. Or if you get to an undual, you get into the nowness, the eternal now, or the timelessness, there's no time. And I realized that all these both are true, but and the other alternative, which is experiencing absolute time, the actual nature of time. And what is that like? What makes time possible? Mm -hmm what makes timelessness possible. It was interesting because I, I, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting to discover anything like that. I just realized they were thinking I wasn't understanding some teachings. So but that remained in me as some kind of a question, curiosity that at some point brought about a certain opening. And is do you find a value then in for your students in just holding a kind of question almost like a i guess it feels like a, a genji koan a life koan yeah well you see different people are different mm -hmm. some of my students are appreciate one kind of realization more than others speaks to them more than others that's what i found mm -hmm. out that not everybody is interested in just love or not everybody is interested in awareness. I mean, they all, many of them will be open to all, all of them, but there is a gravitation in the soul toward the one particular thing that more than others. And so giving, teaching different kind of realization, I'll be speaking to different people. Everybody will learn them, but some people gravitate about a certain thing and will tend to delve into them, open into them more deeply, more completely. And it turns out like they had some glimpses, they didn't know what it was, and the teaching gives them, oh, that's what it is, and they could learn it more fully. Mm -hmm. So it's useful that way. Mm -hmm. But it is also the reason I wrote those books as I was putting into the spiritual discourse and what I call non-standard realization, because uh, spiritual discourse, especially in the way it has uh, materialized in the last few decades, it became focused on certain kind of realization as if that's how spirituality is. And I wanted to show that's true, but not completely true, there are other ways people can experience things that are just as valid, just as true. And I think that enriches the field and opens it up. Yes, uh, that's definitely something I've appreciated about these books because uh, non-duality became kind of the... Uh, well, the, the, the good above all other goods in a way. And, and, uh, and what you did was show that that's one perspective, one view, one possibility, and that 
your fourth turning, as you call it, call it which you, and this view of totality can appreciate that, can appreciate the value and validity uh, and equality in some ways of multiple realizations and no realization. Right. Yeah, yeah you so could. it's a it's a different kind of freedom because each state of realization has freedom in it, sense of freedom, mm -hmm. liberation. But then there is the freedom of not needing any one of them. Yes. You see, that's a it is a freedom, but it's a different kind of freedom. Yes, almost like a meta freedom. Um and and rare as I see it. I mean, point I, I there's a sense in which there's a pointing to this in in teachings of non-attachment and openness, etc. But this is this is very different and and novel. It feels I, like. I, I I myself suspect that some teachers in different tradition got to that point, but they don't speak it because mm. it's not part of their tradition. Ah, uh, yes. And they don't want to disturb the traditional teaching. You see. So it's just their experience. They might tell, talk to their friends, but they won't do it as part of the teaching. But they uh -huh. might live it. Because naturally, they happen. I, I can't yeah. imagine the, for some of these people who are really free, it doesn't happen. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, I, want, uh, uh, just, I was just thinking in, in terms of your, your view of equality or both non-finality, but also particularly the view of the recognition that every experience is, is reality speaking to us, is living beings manifestation. And uh, I, the thought of the Zen of ordinariness as a son came to mind as one possible yeah. uh, expression yeah. of that. Does that resonate? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. The ordinary, in fact, one of the freest realization is the appreciation of the simplicity of the ordinary. You see, people don't know what ordinary means. Most people know the ordinary as being full of ego suffering. Mm. But there mm. is an ordinary in the sense that ordinary, you're a person having your life, whatever, but there isn't self, there isn't suffering, but it is ordinary. There is no light, no flashing lights, no, none of that business, no such thing as pure awareness. No, it's just regular life, but there's no suffering. Uh, do you find that people have to go through some of those flashing lights and you know big awakening uh, things to get to that point where the yeah. simplicity? I, I think that might be necessary. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a way of the openness of the system. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you're yeah. reminding me of the the ox herding pictures, those wonderful portrayals of the of the stage and the final picture of the. Yeah. Uh, entering the marketplace with help bestowing hands, and there's a line in the commentary: "Even the wisest cannot find them." And I think, in, even in the even in the picture before that, uh, um, I'm forgetting the name, but uh, there's a there's a commentary: "If birds were to drop flowers on him, he could not be in, but be dismayed with the sense that that there's a realization that." that uh, of the non-specialness, of the ordinariness yeah. of, of, of this level of awakening, which feels like in some ways it resonates with what you, you point to, Ramit. Yeah, it is a kind of freedom of lightness that with no, no concern, you know. Mm. Hamid, I would be amiss if I didn't ask this following question. Heidi yes. always wants me to ask this, and I want to ask it too, but it's, it's what is your practice now at this stage of your life? It continues to be inquiry. I mean, I meditate regularly. I do have my medica meditations, but mostly my inquiry, my practice is just continuing inquiry, which is sort of natural by now. It's not something I have to do. It just happens as part of the process of my living. 
could you give us an example of what that inquiry would look like? Well, just like what I mentioned to you about time. You know, I wasn't thinking. I, I read it some years ago. I realized I didn't understand it. And a few years later, experience happens. And I experienced myself as time. And that started the whole process of me looking into, wow, this is, I am time. How about other things? How about other people? <laughs> and what, what, what does it mean that I'm time? You know, what's, what's it taste like? What it feels like? And, you know, saying, I wanted to know everything about it. And Hamid, when you meditate, what, what is your practice? What do you do? Well, it depends. I mean, the main thing, I just sit down and don't do anything. That's meditation. And uh, sometimes I don't do anything. Sometimes, you know, I pay attention to certain things. You see, in the sense, um, if I notice that... Uh, depending on how I find myself. And sometimes I feel there's a need to be more grounded in the here and now. So that will make me pay attention more to the belly center, in the hara. But if that is not an issue, I just sit there and be quiet and sink into the quietness. Do, do you find that at times you'll get an illumination about some issue you have been kind of chewing on or looking at or thinking about in the stillness, will it just kind of, oh. oh yeah, of course, stillness <laughs> brings out all time insights and illuminations. But you see, most of my uh, illuminations or my awakening don't happen in meditation. It happen is like I'm taking a shower, I remember there was a period when most of my illumination had been taking baths. <laughs> you know, uh, other times, it's I'm walking or talking with a friend, and you know, and so life itself, you know, is a really field where things happen. Well, maybe I'll take Let's more baths. Think about time, for instance, where where I had the experience, I had in a store. <laughs> friend of mine was shopping. I sat in the chair looking at the street and suddenly I, I realized I was experiencing things differently. Yeah, you, you mentioned about practice in this book that it's, it's yeah. really hopeless. You can't do it, but it's absolutely essential that yeah. you do it in, in a right. courageous and a, de a dedicated way. And that seems to, I don't know, make us open to grace or something make it makes us open yeah. to that's what i call the dynamic of real uh, of realization which you know for most people they have to practice you know what do you do you practice and we believe our practices is what's going to cause uh, opening or realization when really the practice you could say it's a opens us up or prepares us for grace. But in fact, the grace is already happening by the fact we, we felt like practicing. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and in these books, you, you describe a, uh, a development of motivation, but usually most of us start with some achievement, goal, orientation, self, I want to be this or that or get that. And the, that can, I, hopefully that shifts into a more altruistic, uh, perhaps even bodhisattvic aspiration for the welfare and the awakening of all. But you point out that that's not final either. It's still, there's still a sense of a doing and an, that there's not a recognition that, that even the, even that kind of practice is not fully acknowledging the extent to which true nature is operating through us uh, to yeah. realize itself. Yeah. Love to hear it you takes a great that. deal of maturity 
in the sense of having enough experience and encounters with our true nature to understand that. It doesn't come just, you know, without experience. It's, it's, it's the, uh, the different kind of realization awakening happening and maturing our consciousness or our soul that gets us to that place of, you know, Yeah. And and what a gift it it is I, for me over these last uh, last couple of years there was there was a realization oh, sitting in med meditation, meditation that um, that uh, there was a enormous chasm between the slightest bit of doing or efforting or trying to change anything and simply the the allowing the being the the non doing and. Yeah. yeah, I'm. I mean, one of the main important good meditation is to be aware of how we're trying to make things happen or make things because we can't uh, say, okay, I shouldn't do. You can't do that, you know, because you're doing. <laughs> if you do, yeah. you try to do that, you'll be doing. It's uh, sort of awareness of how we're doing, and at some point, awareness, I can't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah you're being done yeah yeah, yeah. Um, well i mean this, this book um i was going through some really pretty uh dark painful times uh this book i definitely um uh, uh, transmission came through i guess you'd say that uh kind of sparked more hope in me you know I'm glad to hear that a little more joy and more okay okay yeah, you know, hard times happen, but this is what you're doing. And uh, there was, yeah. you know, it, it was just a big help. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, that's why I wrote the books for things like that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one who got it, but, you know, I got it. No, no, it has certainly, certainly been enormously, enormously beneficial to me. Um, yeah, at least we have two here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, <laughs> that's why we. That's why we're together. <laughs> yeah, I'm the third one. <laughs> <laughs> I was re I was going over the books in the last few days because I haven't, you know, looked at them for several years, and you know, just leaving through them to, so I remember what did I write, and I realized I was getting so <laughs> intensely in such an intense energy. I felt, oh, I was going to explode. I was getting the transmission from he's <laughs> reading the book. <laughs> and I was getting lots of it because I was going through the whole thing. <laughs> well, I've been reading them again uh, myself for this time for the third time. And and uh, as with any profound text, it was the experience, oh, where was I the last time I read this? Why didn't I see this the last time? <laughs> And uh, I, I find that with any really profound text that each time you you go through it, 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 it opens to you to new facets and depths and possibilities. And that's certainly been my experience, experience with these. Um, I, I and, think that, you know, Raja happens every time we read something that comes from direct awakening or experience. Yes, yes. That, there's we, we all discover new thing in it. Yes, because it's not coming from the mind, which is a you know formed idea, but coming in expressing a certain experience. So there is a lot more to the experience that is you know expressed in one word or another or in between the sentences, and you know, some are not expressed, might become obvious as an implication. Yes, and. And there's a sense of that the, the, the these books and more generally what you're speaking of, uh, communication that comes directly out of realization, out of proud, deep personal experience, is psychoactive. That kind of communication has the yes. possibility of true transmission. And that's what that's what I experience with these books. They're really they're really a transmission of uh, 
of an aspect of uh, yeah, and, and transmission, and you, 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 a person has to be open to the transmission. You're open to it. You know about this. You're open to it. You're not resisting it. You want to learn, so you get the transmission. Doesn't mean everybody will get the transmission, or will get as much. You know, you can get different degrees of transmission too. No, but as we said earlier about writing, you had to be open also to get yeah. this stuff down, and. Um, uh, that's uh must be a remarkable thing. I, I, I think it, in my own little way is when we feel that we're finally out of the way enough for something good, something beyond ourselves to come through us. And that's, that's probably one yeah, of them. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's not, I'm out of the way I'm gone. <laughs> There's no one here. <laughs> There is just what the truth that is speaking. That's all. Mm. You know, mm. there is not only for Gavti. You can't find the one. So out of the way definitely is an important stage. But there comes a time it's not just you're out of the way. There's no you to be found. Mm. And oh, that's nice. <laughs> I, mean, that's I mean, that's good. Feels terrific. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, this, these realizations you've had, and the point, and the possibility you're pointing to of, of a kind of uh, dynamism of awakening that takes over, that keeps, isn't content with resting in one place, which, which opens us in more and more, or deeper and deeper, endlessly into other perspectives and possibilities and insights. This, this is such an important dynamic. And you mentioned curiosity as a key thing in the book, as a facilitator of this, you men mentioned in the book uh, that having an experience of true nature, a very deep pervasive experience of true nature seems to be essential. And you also mentioned uh, if you speak of the multiple realizations you've had, and that perhaps if you had to point to one as most uh, catalytic, it would be um, awareness in its diamond-like crystal clarity. So these are just some of the things I recall that you're pointing to that were important for catalyzing this runaway realization. Uh, are there others? Well, that's what, what began the recognition of one runaway realization. That kind of, uh, what I call the Vajra body, uh, having a, a diamond crystalline, not just clarity, but presence, a new kind of presence that's not just, I call it non-standard presence, you know, where yeah. presence a particular presence that implicit in it all other possibilities of presence or or spiritual qualities and um, I think that's very important for opening you know to runaway realization because this presence is in some sense can be seen uh, as the source of those realization. It, it opens up the, the way for possibilities of all possible realization. Mm. But it is a particular way that our consciousness or our individual soul can at some point transform into this kind of diamond kind of presence. And is that a is that kind of opening or awakening to that diamond presence, crystalline clarity, investigative precision? Is that fostered by anything in particular? I didn't get the question. Um, 
you pointed to this possibility of this diamond like or Vajra yeah. body, I think you called it, which is so important for this ongoing catalytic runaway realization. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. It, it, it's very helpful. I don't know if it's needed, but my experience, that's really what made it happen. Yeah. And is there anything you've noticed that particularly allows people to realize this Vajra body realization? It's usually, in my experience, happened in the midst of non-dual realization, the depth of mm. it. In the depth of it, I recognized there was something happening there I didn't understand. Something was arising within it, a, a particular, not mm. the expanse, a particular within the expanse, which didn't make sense. There's nothing in the expanse. Usually it's empty except at the surface. But here there was something floating in the expanse. I said, what is that? What's that? What does that mean? So uh, I didn't know what it was. I was curious about for a few years, actually, before it finally it revealed itself. So the and 10 doubts was opening was, up a whole other universe of possibilities. The other the possibility was that particular that was born in the non-dual was that that gave the hope for a whole nother universe that yeah mm. for me it was born in the non-dual yeah mm. i'm aware that you will need to leave shortly i mean i just want to i want to just focus for a moment then on on the gift of this dialogue because i'm aware as you've been describing certain possibilities now as you describe the possibility for example of a a crystalline clarity. I notice my own awareness becoming clearer and brighter and, and more precise. So I want to just acknowledge the, the gift of this dialogue and the transmission that's occurring in the midst of it. And uh, what a priceless gift that is. Well, we are all open to each other, which I think makes that possible. And really good, nice to have that kind of, this kind of dialogue. Yeah, it's it's a priceless gift, and I think we're just both of us. So John can speak for himself, but uh, but but I think for both of us, this has been a priceless gift. And your books, uh, and your work, and your teaching, and your school, the diamond work, all are just truly priceless gifts. I mean, I don't know anything comparable. And uh, that's, you know, I spent my life has been a search for both inquiry myself, but also looking across yes. the different traditions. And I think you're, you're really know, carving you, new territory. For decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd think I'd be more awake, wouldn't you? <laughs> you've been engaged for decades. I thought, <laughs> I, I, wonderful to see you turned on to, to the truth this way. Oh, it's such a gift to me. I am so, I mean, I, it's been a, such a privilege to do these dialogues with people, but yeah. this is the one I've been looking forward to most. And it's truly been, ah, it's so, it's so um, exciting, doesn't do it, just, it is illuminating to have this kind of dialogue and to have this kind of transmission that you offer and you know, simply offering your being and your work and your exploration and your, the yeah. fruits of your inquiry. And hopefully it will support everybody's realization, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and opens it up to other possibilities. Both supports and opens up. Yeah. Bobby, is, there, is there any last thing before, well, as, as we you know, end this remarkable chapter in my life anyway, that seems that you would like to say or express? As we talk, I'm feeling more love and sweetness. Mm. I feel the whole field pervaded by some kind of nectary, delicious sweetness. And, and that's one thing I want to say. The more we discover reality, the heart matures and deepens more. It's not just, you know, discovering curiosity and knowing. The heart deepens and expands in all of it. Mm which is what makes us really human. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for that gift. 
that was yes i mean this has been a priceless gift and uh, and hopefully it will get out widely to lots of people and be a priceless gift to many many others and huh? may your transmission continue ripple out endlessly thank you so much okay thank you great so talking with the two of you <laughs> yes yeah. okay priceless gift gave me the opportunity to share whatever it is have being share its possibilities yes <laughs> i don't well, want to say me i don't want to take credit for all of this i understand yeah. and and for that we thank you too <laughs> i mean thank you very much deep gratitude Deep gratitude.